Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we're really excited to have Peter D. Benedictus with us. Peter's uh, been a friend of mine for a number of years now, and I've taken a number of his classes. He's uh, a gifted uh, uh, intuitive and uh, has been um, doing a lot of channeling work. And uh, specifically today, we're going to be showing you or Peter's going to be showing you how to create your own dimensional portal. So this is going to be pretty exciting stuff. I have some information that I'll be sharing uh, uh, a little bit at, uh, later after uh, Peter's made his presentation and before he actually shows you how to do this. So welcome, Peter. And uh, we're, we're excited to have you here today and can't wait to uh, to learn about this new information. Hey, Charlie, thank you so much for inviting me on with you and hey to everybody out there. Uh, so I'm Peter D. You can find me at becomingawesome.one, becomingawesome.one. And uh, we also have like classes for this information if you want to do practice sessions. But you should get enough just from this video today to create your own dimensional portal. So I'm going to shift into a PowerPoint and explain to you what it is that uh, spirit has showed me energetically this pattern that we'd like to create so here we go into this powerpoint beautiful okay so i'm sitting in the hot tub about six months ago and spirit shows me this really intricate pattern and I'm like, what is this? And it's a series, or it's a, not a series, a combination of two Tauruses spiraling in opposite directions. So one, you'll see it's going up and then the energy goes down through you in a spiral. And then the other Taurus is going down and the energy comes up to you spiraling in the opposite direction. So it took me a while to actually see this pattern clearly that I was being shown. And I'm like, okay, spirit, so why this? And they're like, oh, this is it, Peter. This is how you're going to access all that final stuff you've been wanting to. You know, you want to change timelines. You want to create better manifestations. You want to just uh, do remote viewing or access in, uh, knowledge from the Akashic Records. This is how it's done. And I'm like, oh, cool. And spirit basically says... Hey, everybody does this all the time, but we do it at such small levels. We don't really power it and we don't focus on it and use it. And so we don't get the advantage of it. But you wouldn't be alive if you weren't doing it. And people who channel or can bilocate or do remote viewing, they already are doing this, but they're doing it unconsciously. So my mission is to make it simple to understand on how people can ramp this up, especially if you have a science mind and how you can start to create dimensional portals and then get your own creations. So let's go into the uh, science of consciousness a little bit so we can understand what we're trying to access. This is uh, Stuart Hammerhoff. He's an MD, anesthesiologist, quantum conscious theorist. Uh, he's also the director for the Center of Consciousness of Universe of Center of Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona. So, you know, he's not a lightweight. He's pretty far up there in the academic science world, okay? And Hammerhoff wanted to figure out where consciousness is. Where is consciousness? And uh, being an anesthesiologist, he had the idea of putting parts of the brain asleep, just progressively putting parts of the brain asleep and then seeing when consciousness left or not. And you know this, you can go under for a surgery and your heart still beats. You're not conscious, but you're still alive, right? So he's trying to find out what is it exactly that moves a person from the conscious to the unconscious state. And so he did this by applying uh, anesthetics to different parts of the brain. And he eventually discovered that right there, on the edges of the neurons, there are little things called microtubules. And these are these little connectors that run from the dendrite of one neuron to another neuron. And that when the microtubules were put asleep, consciousness is when the person left. So he was able to identify that consciousness is in these microtubules. Now, this was beautiful. This was a great understanding. Uh, but then one of his friends said, hey, Stuart, that's really good, but you still don't know what consciousness is. You don't know where how it works. 
And he's like, yeah, that's true. We just physically located where our body accesses it. And that's in these microtubules. Okay. So now let's take a look up close up of microtubule. What you're seeing is these little, these are the green parts on this drawing here. Okay. And they're just little tubes and that these are connected into your synapse where those dendrites are. And sometimes they're called like telomeres, the parts that stick out and they actually connect between the actual synapses in your brain. All right. So these are where the microtubules are. And what's interesting is they're not just in brain cells. They're in every cell of your body, which brings the whole question up. Oh, oh is all your cells conscious? And if you talk to people like Bruce Lipton, then absolutely they are. All your cells are consciousness because they all have this. Now, what makes the brain special is that there's higher concentrations of these. So there's more ability to access and interface with that consciousness because there's more microtubules in the brain cells. Okay. So now the traditional view of science and consciousness is that it's mechanical. All right. So consciousness, if you ask a traditional scientist, they would tell you it arose from biochemical interactions of brain cells. And then they would say, as you got more connections and more interactions, a bigger brain, your neural network became bigger. And then boom, consciousness happened. In other words, we reached this threshold that's it. Consciousness kicked in. So basically as animals evolved, consciousness evolved. That's what traditional researchers will tell you. Well, Hammerhoff wasn't satisfied with that. So he contacted Roger Penrose, a mathematician, physicist, philosopher, and happened to have a Nobel laureate in physics. Okay. So again, not a very, very shallow person. This guy's come up one of the, another one of the big guns in the worlds of consciousness and understanding. And together, Hammerhoff and Penrose put together what's uh, called the Orchestrated Objective Reduction Theory, ORC O R. Okay. Orchestrated Objective Reduction. And what this theory basically says is that, uh, well, first of all, combined approaches from molecular biology, neuroscience, pharmacology, philosophy, quantum information theory, and quantum gravity combined it all together. And so it's not just a single discipline study looking at it. This is makes it so cool. And they came up with the idea that consciousness originates at the quantum level inside neurons. So rather than it's a product of the connections, there's something going on at the quantum level that allows them to access consciousness. They believe ORC OR to be a quantum process orchestrated in microtubules. So if the microtubules do the orchestration, then boom, consciousness is expressed, not that it emerges, it's expressed. Uh, now, in their understanding, consciousness is based on non-computable quantum processing performed by qubits formed collectively on cellular microtubules. Uh, that's a big sentence, right? A lot of big words there. So non-computable means it's not happening in a sequence that's computed this and then that and then this other, okay? But it's actually a collection of qubits, which we're going to get into in a little bit. And these qubits then express in your neurons because there's such a heavy network of them, they're amplified. And that's how consciousness emerges in you. Now, what's cool about this is that it gives you free will. It's the first explanation that science has ever produced that explains consciousness and allows for free will. It's not just a mechanical mechanistic thing. So this is kind of why they have a, you know, some of the spiritual aspects of what's going on here. It's very, very cool. All right. So now let's get into these qubits a little bit. So we saw those uh, diagram of those microtubules. Now, the microtubules have these little packets of information on them, these little protein qubits. And that's when those are activated, that's when consciousness shows up. So Orco, our theory asserts that consciousness emerges as the complexity of the computations informed by the cerebral neurons increases. So you get more complex, right? And then boom, you have enough to access these qubits at a super deep level. And that's when you have access to consciousness. All right. Now, in their theory, consciousness is based on non-computable quantum processing. All right. So this means 
it's not a process of do you think this and then you get that the if then if then like it is the mechanical view this is an organic view that consciousness is there and it comes out as you express okay now this is the key that expression they call it orchestration and it's the hypothetical process by which the connective microtubule proteins influence a qubit state reduction by modifying the space-time separation of their superimposed state. Now, this is where it gets really crazy. So they're talking about a superimposed state. So this is the difference between uh, classical computation that's mechanical. You know, a switch is either on or off, right? And then you have an if-then, and that's how you have computer programming and all that other stuff. In the quantum world, you see that things are both in the on state and the off state at the same time. And as a result of this, the they're superimposed. This reality and this other reality are superimposed. And Hammerhoff and Penrose say orchestration is where you focus in on those superimpositions. And then that creates what you would call your con your consciousness. And so this kind of opens up all of time and space to you, which is why I was telling you earlier that when you can practice this uh, pattern, this energy pattern I'm going to show you, you can access time and space. You can move your consciousness around. You can change manifestations. You can change timelines. Okay. Now, take a look at this picture for just a second. All right. So in normal classical physics, you would sit there and you would draw a circle and put a dot on it and go, this is the electron and this electron has an orbit, okay? But in this picture, you see that there's many orbits and many positions that the electron can be in. This is what makes it a qubit rather than a bit. A classical bit has uh, an on-off state, it's binary. There's a yes, there's a no, there's a this position or that position. But a qubit, all right, rather than being a two-state device, a qubit is a multi-state device. So it can be in both states at once. That's why I like this picture, because it's not just one place the electron can be, it's any place it can be within the orbit or in any of the different orbits all at the same time. Okay, and then it's like the classical uh, theory that, you know, the slit experiment where you put your observation is where things end up. And that's how quantum physics explains this kind of superimposed state. So now in a classical electron, you would say, oh, it has a spin. It goes in one direction. Okay, but in a quantum state, there's two spin states. It could be spinning to the left and also spinning to the right at the same time or up or down at the same time, okay? So these simultaneous states is, makes a qubit different from a bit. And when you have qubits in coherent superposition of multiple states at the same time, in other words, they're in all these different states, but they're also incoherent. And that means they're in one place and one, one state at the same time. And this creates all kinds of fun stuff. I'm going to explain that in a minute. It creates what's called time crystals. But first, I want to talk about these microtubules in a bit more. So they're composed of polychromatic hydrocarbons. All right. So here's just several of them and the basic structures. And if you know how to do uh, uh, biochemistry, then you'll know what all these little symbols mean. You'll know the extra line is where the plus or the minus is for the charges, for the electrons, which then create the structure of the hydrocarbon. And here's just some of what they look like. Now, qubits are based on oscillating dipoles, all right, forming superimposed resonance rings in helical pathways through lattices of microtubules. So they get together in a lattice structure. So they get put together one after the other after the other, and they oscillate. So sometimes the pluses are together like this, sometimes they're like that. And so they're in these different states of connection, but they're still all the same polyaromatic hydrocarbon. All right. So now these oscillations are either electric, okay, uh, you know, London forces, magnetic energy, or the spin. But there also could be the oscillation due to nuclear spins, right? 
Uh, they're not sure exactly what, but what they do know is that when they measured these oscillations, they find they come in what are called triplets of triplets. So they occur at the gigahertz level, the megahertz level, and the kilohertz level within the areas they measured. So this is kind of interesting. You get all these oscillations and they happen in orders of magnitude. And they all show these same kind of variations at the different orders of magnitude. And they're superimposed both this way and that way. Okay. So this is where Dr. Uh, Anurban, and I'm not going to try his last name, shows up. And Dr. Anurban He's, he's no slouch either. He's the principal research scientist, National Institute for Material Science in Japan. Uh, over 100 published uh, papers okay, that he's the lead author on, <laughs> not just the co-author. So this is, again, super high-level science guy. And he was the one who found what's called these triplets of triplets. So he would put in a conductive frequency into these polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and he would see that they would resonate in patterns. And you can see that if you look in the first part to the uh, far left of the screen. This is what I was talking about, these frequency ranges where you'd get these patterns that repeat. And they always came in sets of three, three sets of three, triplets of triplets. So that's kind of an indication that, oh, when you see these patterns, consciousness is taking place on, a, on an electrochemical level. Okay. All right. So we just covered that. Now, this is how you create time crystals. Uh, and this is not just something these dudes made up. It's been theorized since the 1960s that time crystals exist. And time crystals are when you have a structure that repeats a pattern over and over. So for instance, an ordinary crystal like salt or quartz, the atom is just arranged, you know, in that same pattern, right? Everything's in the same place. But in a time crystal, there's those oscillating variations I told you about. They're sometimes this way, they're sometimes that way. And they go through a regular cycle of these variations and then end up in the same place. So you have all the changes and then the same, all the changes, then the same. And it just happens over time. Actually, it doesn't actually happen over time. Actually, no time passes, but it is happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay and so that's why uh that's why they call it a time crystal it's like a piece of frozen time that has all these different uh states in it okay which is really kind of fun so there's no energy and moved it's a stable professional perpetual motion machine at the quantum level so all the people who tell me about the laws of entropy mm, at the quantum level not so much you got time crystals that are in perpetual motion which gives rise to the question is it possible to have 4D matter, matter that's in a different density? And the answer is if you uh, follow what time crystals show you, yes, then of course you do. All right, so now what are my conscious, my takeaways from all this lecture on consciousness? Uh, so far, my first takeaway is that there's a spin involved, those oscillating frequencies, there's a spin involved, okay? The second Okay, takeaways that besides this spin, the oscillating frequencies that occur in a regular pattern in the microtubules, okay? Uh, and we can see that those are either electric, magnetic, or nuclear in creation. So besides a spin, I have the takeaway that consciousness is fractal, okay? And that means that there's little tiny bits of it, and then it repeats at a higher level and a higher level and a higher level. And we saw that when it was measuring, when Airbon was measuring the triplet of triplets, okay, that the consciousness pattern would show up at all these different orders of magnitude on the scales that he was measuring it at. Okay, so it's kind of like you have these time crystals, they repeat at a regular pattern. So you have all the different states it can be, boom, it ends up in one state. And so each of those states it can be is an aspect of what consciousness can be, all right? So it's happening at many levels all at once. Now, we just call it our world, you know, in regular mundane 3D stuff. We call whatever we're thinking our consciousness because that's our focus. But if all this stuff is true, then where you put your focus, your energy, then you can create different realities you literally have access to because uh, the consciousness is fractal. 
And basically it's kind of like nesting dolls, right? Don't want to put it way out into the universe, into the big stuff. And people who channel know this, they can talk to source or they can talk to these sets of entities or this soul group or this higher self or this individual person. Just it's all kind of like a ladder. You move up and down and it's where you put your consciousness. It's fractal. Okay. Now, just a little side note, because it's fun, is uh, let's introduce Dante Loretta. And he was the dude who was in charge of the NASA's mission to Bennu, one of the asteroids that were came close enough to Earth. And NASA decided to check it out. And here was the guy who was running point on that thing. And guess what he found on these asteroids? Polyaromatic hydrocarbons. <laughs> okay. And so what this ends up showing you is that, well, if they're out there in outer space, then that means they're not limited to Earth. And that means the building blocks of consciousness on the biochemical level are not just Earth-based. That means consciousness is elsewhere. Okay. And that it precedes what we call life here because some of the stuff they're measuring is way back. And the basis of consciousness can be measured to be existing before what we call human beings. So this is kind of important to know. Consciousness is out there. We didn't create it because we got organized. We access this field of consciousness. Okay. Now this leads to some bigger questions by, and I think Dr. Nassim Haramin is the guy who's answered these better than anybody I've seen so far. And Harriman talks about, first of all, he's the director of research at the International Space Federation. So a whole collection of super big brained people. And he's the guy running point at that. Okay. And he created a unified field theory, which posits the foundational fabric of space time itself is a hollow fractal tetrahedral lattice structure at the sub quantum Planck scale. Okay. So if you go past all those big words, hologram, tetrahedral, which means the number of sides, and then lattice, you've heard that before, right? And it's basically, you put this lattice together at this very, very tiny, small scale, and boom, that's the fabric of space-time. And if you accept that, you get the idea that you're actually exchanging information with all of the universe through every one of your atoms right now. That's what we are talking about, that fractal thing, okay? That uh, in fact, what's going on inside you at the sub Planck scale is going on everywhere in what we call our universe. Okay, so first of all, this is just a cool picture of a nice torus right there, but I think it really represents what uh, what Tahara means trying to get at, because we'll look at what's going on inside it. So now, you know what pixels are. If you're watching this on a TV or computer screen, you know that every little dot is a pixel, and that's how it made up. Well, Haramine talks about the concept of voxels, which are like pixels, but they're in 3D. They're not just flat. So they go out into the different directions, okay? And what's interesting to me is that these have a refresh rate, right? Remember that quantum spin we were talking about in the time crystals? There's a refresh rate, which means every fraction of a second, there's a new universe in front of you that's being shown, okay? Um, and that's this holographic lattice that expresses as our space-time reality based on our focus, okay? And if you want to go take classes in physics, you can at spacefed.com <laughs> you know who needs who needs to enroll in a university just go get it right from the teachers okay all right so now this is kind of cool so we've got this torus field right and what Hermine tells us is that all these voxels are connected that's why you see all these other little voxels uh torus fields spinning around here so within every voxel is a toroidal wormhole, according to Harami, right? That's at the heart of all these little things. And we're talking really tiny sub Planck scale, which is tinier than the tiny quantum bits that they normally measure. All right. And these wormholes are connected to all the other wormholes in all the other voxels. 
Now, if I remember correctly, he said it's like each voxel contains half the number of wormholes as there are voxels in the universe. So each voxel has a, a this uncountable number of wormholes, which equals half the number of wormholes of the voxels in the universe. So each one is connected. Right. And that's what I love about this image, these little toroidal fields. And this is what Haramine does is all the math to explain how they're all connected. So he says, if you look at the top uh, left part of the screen, everything emerges from and returns to a fundamental field of information that connects us all. Okay. He went on and posted on Facebook once there is an interaction between all things in the universe. It is a network of interconnected structures that communicate with each other. There is no isolated system in the universe. So to consider that the brain is isolated from the universe is inaccurate. It is as if there were communication between all scales and the result of what we call the consciousness of existence. It is as if the universe thinks about itself and discovers itself. It is a loop of information creating consciousness. So at this very, very tiny level, everything's all connected and everything's all aware of everything else. And that is what the consciousness that, you know, if you accept what Haramine's saying and then you accept what Stuart Hammerhoff and uh, Roger Penrose are saying, when they're talking about these little qubits on your microtubules accessing and expressing these uh, these uh, quantum states, then basically they're talking about what Hera means saying. They're expressing all these different connections. And because there's so many of them and they're superimposed because of the time crystals changing, where you put your focus then becomes the creation of that universe. It's like literally creating universes. It's really crazy. All right, so we're going to stop there, and I'm just going to give you uh, this takeaway for a second that uh, Haramine gives us the unified theory of everything, and as a result, he explains it consciousness. Stuart Hammerhoff give us our Stuart Hammerhoff and Roger Penrose give us the orc. Uh, reduction theory orchestrated reduction theory of consciousness which is how we distill from that field of everything into what we're being what i've discovered is that what you're seeing are the same patterns i was shown and i was quite stunned because i didn't know that this was all science-based i'm like okay spirit you're showing me something i don't know what it is what am i going to do with it and spirit basically says when you master this skill then you are going to have your own personal dimensional portal and this is how you can then start to move your consciousness around. You want a remote view. You want to go and see what happened in the past. You want to talk to a different entity because they're not in your conscious physical plane and you can't use your voice. You want to shift timelines. You want to do manifestation. We've done all these little things separately. And now spirit is showing me that the planet is ready and we're moving with enough consciousness on the earth now to put it together into a system where anybody can start accessing all these skills rather than just going on the woo-woo spiritual path, going on the path of discovering, here's how the energy works. Let me get the energy working in that pattern. Now I'm going to apply my consciousness to it and then stuff happens. So that's the theory behind all this. And Charlie, you've got some stuff you want to add. When you're done, I'll go into the how-to. Let's learn how to do it. Okay, that sounds great. I I have a couple of things. This uh, a lot of the information that Peter's working on fits really nicely with a, a scaling model that I put together, and so I wanted to show just a few of these things to show you that you know what Peter's talking about really is backed up with uh, uh, mathematics and geometry. But before we do that, I just wanted to comment on one thing you said earlier and to try to confirm it. I don't have a slide on this, but you mentioned that that uh, consciousness precedes life itself. And, you know, there was a there was some research that was done. I think it was about six or eight years ago in Australia at the Australian National University, where they tried to replicate the double slit experiments from, uh, the, you know, the 20th century. And there's always been concern that the observer was, you know, was involved in some way. So they decided to come up with a way of 
making the decision of whether this was going to be a wave or a particle after it's the, the point where this had passed and <laughs> through the slate. So, so the decision on whether it was a wave or a particle only happened after it passed this point of no return, so to speak. Well, as it turns out, uh, it was 100% precise in, in, in terms of predicting, but it wasn't predicting. It was going out into this ether where there's no time and space, and it was just grabbing this one of infinite possibilities out of the ether and and making and and creating that experience. So yes, wow. indeed, yes, indeed, we we have proof that that what is actually being stated here, you know, has been proven uh, scientifically. So it's all really cool stuff. I love that, <laughs> Charlie. Just yeah. love that. Okay, so one of the first things I wanted to do was to to talk about the the whole idea of scaling and um, uh, get into a little bit more information about it. Now, one of the things that that um, many ancient philosophers and uh, spoke to, Plato certainly being one, and more recently, uh, Johannes Kepler, he he tried to come up with a a method of of determining the spacing of the planets based upon the spacing or the scaling uh, nesting of the platonic solids uh, within spheres. And although that did not work well, as it turns out, uh, the scaling that is involved in platonic solids uh, fits perfectly with uh, uh, geometries that are associated with not only the torus, but also with uh, the scaling of fractals as well. So I just want to go through this uh, quickly. This is an example of the platonic solids uh, showing up in microclusters. Now, microclusters are actually an intermediate state between the ether and, and solid matter. And what this is, this is just a distillation of some photographs that were taken. They were putting gold uh, atoms into this um, uh, tube. And what they found was that they would morph. They would change from, from one platonic solid form to the next. So all of this is not at all just random you know, pie in the sky theory. And in fact, when we go and do the mathematics on the scaling of the platonic solids, this comes actually from the work of uh, Robert Lawler in his work, um, Sacred Geometry, Philosophy and Practice. But this, uh, this diagram over here on the left um, is a representation of um, the various platonic solids and the circumscribing and inscribing circles in two dimensions that would encap or three, if we were to do it in three dimensions, these would be spheres. But the bottom line here is, is that all of these uh, this this almost is like a uh, keyboard key keys on the keyboard on the piano. You have five basic platonic solids rather than seven major keys in an octave. But the idea is the same because the theory has always been that you can start with one of the uh, five platonic solids, such as the icosahedron, and uh, it will change into an octahedron, a tetrahedron, cube, dodecahedron and back to icosahedron. Well, all of this happens with a very specific geometry. And as it turns out, uh, that geometry is incorporated in the Russian pyramids, in uh, cathedral steeples and ancient temples. And it's, it's found everywhere and also in fluid dynamics. But anyway, uh, when you couple this with the uh, idea that uh, you've got the Mandelbrots, excuse me, you've got fractals that are scaling at exactly the same rate, you start to see all of a sudden, wait a minute, maybe there really is a pattern to the universe and there is precision, you know, perfect precision in the way that the universe is, is connected. So here's another uh, example. This is the Mandelbrot set 
this is a an example of uh, fractals. This is the most uh, well known uh, example of that. And if we go and look at the scaling of the circles uh, in the Mandelbrot set, we find that they scale with this exact same phi cubed uh, type geometry. When we get into um, the uh, microtubules that uh, Peter was describing earlier, this comes actually from the Oak, excuse me, Orc OR uh, document that uh, Hammeroff and, and Penrose wrote. And what you see here is that helical pathways follow along neighboring tubular dimers in the A lattice. This is all highly scientific, but what's important here is that they repeat every five and eight tubulums respectively uh, and follow along neighboring tubulin monomers repeating every three monomers after winding twice around the microtubule. Lots of information here, but what's important for us to understand is that all of these numbers end up relating to the Fibonacci sequence of three, five, eight, and 13. So we know that all of this scaling is involved in the microtubules as it is in the DNA itself. We see here in the DNA uh, that the Fibonacci sequence shows up in the body of the dual strand DNA. And I've done my very best to measure that as well. And I come up with the same 76, 345 geometry. So we're seeing the platonic solid scale in this geometry, um, as do the fractals. Uh, here's kind of a, a, a demonstration of, of this kind of scaling uh, dynamic going on using um, one of the five platonic solids uh, as a base. He's uh, George Leoniak from New Geometry has shown how this fractalization and scaling occurs with both the uh, 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 platonic solids as well as um, with um, uh, the pyramids. And here's an example of how this scaling uh, can actually work as, as you go through one of these iterations, a dodecahedron of a particular size and the next uh, iteration of it, an octave later, it's gonna be phi to the cube larger. So we see all of this stuff showing up. And finally, uh, just to show you how this relates as well to the, uh, to the torus, uh, on the right-hand side here is a spherical, perfectly spherical torus. This is actually a um, an award that's given out um, every year for the fundamental prize in physics. And um, anyway, as you see here, uh, you can take these uh, uh, series of, of circles that we use to um, uh, discover the the pyramid of uh, the Russian pyramid geometry, as well as many, many other things in nature and in um, uh, technology. But that fits perfectly inside, and it fits perfectly inside the um, uh, inside the uh, spherical torus as well. So we see all these things come together. Here's a I'm calling this a preferred pathway of implosion and explosion. Uh, those little blue circles that you see there. This is the uh, the geometry of this explosion uh, uh, pathway uh, of the um, of the platonic solids and fractals. So, just one thing before we get started. I know this is helpful for a lot of my uh, folks to to understand spin, but this is what's called the right hand rule. We're going to be talking about toruses here in a few minutes. Peter's going to be talking about, and I just wanted to kind of show you how you can visually understand this. If you pretended like you were holding uh, like a pencil in this case, or a pen uh, in this example with your right hand, uh, your thumb is gonna be pointing in the direction of the flow and uh, your fingers are gonna be uh, going in the direction of the spin itself. So, uh, if you're looking at something from the ground going up, that's the way you do it. If you're thinking of torsion fields that are coming from the sky, you would just pretend like you're turning it and everything's gonna be spinning in an opposite direction. So um, I can show you that real quickly. I bought this little toy for my granddaughter and decided it was actually a perfect example 
of how these two opposing spins can actually fit together. So this is actually just a little toy I found on Amazon, but it has the exact geometry. And I just wanted to show it to you real quickly. So you can, I really needed two hands to do this, but you can see kind of how these spins can interlock with each other, one going one direction and the other in the other direction. So anyway, those are just some ideas that will probably, I hope will help to uh, explain uh, a little bit of what Peter's been talking about and help to um, uh, help you to visualize uh, the meditation and the practice that we're going to learn. Okay. That's beautiful, Charlie. And that toy looks really fun. And the right hand rule. So, so helpful. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> see, what's I'm really excited about is the practice we're going to go through in just a minute is the nuts and bolts how to we had great scientists and theorists explain, okay, this is what's going on, but it's just kind of cool and interesting, right? You know, so what do you do with it? Now we're going to take the step forward. Okay, how do we actually bring those into our field and then create the reality we want to create as a result of it? So we become conscious creators using these techniques. So let me get back into screen share and... Pick it up on this slide. All right. So now we're going to start talking about Kundalini. Uh, and because that's something that's out there in the world. And it's uh, uh, basically a description for life force energy. Uh, some of the monks who've practiced this for thousands of years uh, in, in Asia will tell you that it's a vehicle for self-realization. It is the direct path path to spiritual transformation and or it's pure ecstasy and bliss and i believe it is all these things from my experience with kundalini uh, now chakras are another common thing that have been out there and they're basically energy centers we have many of them but there are seven primary ones that were uh, most people talk about when they talk about chakras and those are focal points where your kundalini is amplified and then get expressed in your physical, mental, and emotional, and etheric bodies. And they have different colors and patterns, and they make different sounds. But basically, there's eight of them, or excuse me, there's seven of them. And they're kind of stacked up from the base of your spine to just above the crown of your head. And so, building on these two basic concepts. Now, I was taught that an awakened state occurs when your kundalini is elevated. So when you feel your energy come up through your chakras and gets high, and you can do this in many ways, you can do this with breathing, intense breathing patterns, you know, breath of fire, all that stuff, you know, and you just get this really expanded state. Now, for most people, their energy yo-yos, it goes up and then they feel expanded. They're having a Kundalini experience, but then it comes back down and they're back in the world and like, what, where'd that go? Right. You know how it is. You go to a retreat, you feel great, you get home and you feel shitty and it's like i want what i had at the retreat anyway because your kundalini is in a yo-yo state it goes up it goes down now i was taught by the monks who gave me awakening at one university that when you get fully awakened your kundalini goes into orbit so you'll feel it and i felt this it's like now, I mistakenly assumed that it was a two-dimensional orbit. It was just a simple circle that would come up in me and go around the front and loop down and then go back up. Anyway, whether or not the shape is important, I didn't understand that at that time. It is very important, of course. I just didn't understand it. The key here is that it's in orbit. Your kundalini doesn't go up and down like a yo-yo anymore. It stays elevated because you're constantly recycling it back through. The planet is going through an awakening uh, and when I talk about it, I'm not talking about all the awareness and truth or stuff. I'm not talking about that kind of awakening. I'm talking about this Kundalini rising awakening where you're more connected. And this is happening to everybody. Uh, when I check in with spirit, uh, more than 80% of the planet has achieved awakening at very, very small levels. Okay. And they're just starting to notice it, but a big significant chunk of the planet is getting to higher levels of awakening. And that's why we can do the kinds of things that I'm sharing with you, or I just talk to spirit and it gives me information or Charlie, you just put your mind to something. And then all of a sudden, all the patterns are clear and you can present new knowledge. You know, it's just how it works because we, you know, we're at these growing levels of awakening because our Kundalini's in orbit. Now, 
the key is to do different steps. And I've got these broken down in numbers, okay? And this, the first one is spiraling your kundalini. All right, so we're going to use the right hand rule, okay? So you just take your right hand, put your thumb up, and that's the direction of the spiral. It's going to go up through you. So you would practice, all right, every breath, just visualizing your kundalini going up through you. And you just see it not just rising, but spiraling through each of those chakras. And so you would just practice that and that's it. And you get it. That's the first step. I call it 1A. Now you can go the opposite direction. Now people may be thinking, now why is this weird? It's like you're bringing your energy down. No, you're just making your kundalini flow in a different direction. It's still the same amount of energy. If you want it to come from someplace, it'll come from source okay it doesn't matter sky heaven sun doesn't matter but you flip that right hand rule over and now you're going to see it go down through you spiraling in the opposite direction and so if you use your in breath spiraling up use your out breath spiraling down going up with the right hand spiral going down with the other spiral and you're going to have to practice and visualize it because most people can't just get right to it uh some can if you can get right to it, don't bother trying to learn all these individual steps. But until you can get your kundalini clearly, feeling yourself, feeling it go up through you in one direction on a spiral and then down through you in the other direction on a spiral, you practice it. So those are the first steps, A and B. And then step C, can you do both at once instead of alternating breaths? Can you actually see your kundalini just like that toy you showed charlie i gotta go buy that for my instructional videos because it's the turning in both directions at once going up with yep. the right hand spiral going down with the opposite direction spiral and then you would practice that uh and that's why i say do one direction do the other direction alternate on breaths and then when you feel good and it's just a matter of focus now what do you mean move your kundalini well Energy follows awareness, okay? Energy follows awareness. So if you need to, you just simply put your awareness in different places. So if I stand up for a second here, put it 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 here, see it spiral up in you. Or just do a continuous motion and just put your imagination. Oh, I'm sensing it. So energy follows awareness, okay? And so you're just going to get to the point where you can hold in your awareness both spins in both directions, all right, so this is step one of this three steps here. Now, step two, get the kundalini into an orbit and not just a two-dimensional orbit, but a whole torus around you. Get your kundalini orbiting that way, okay? So remember, as it goes through you, it's spiraling, so it's not just you're focusing on the attention on the outside of the donut coming around through you, but it's the spiral. So here's an example of the kundalini going spiraling up, then going around in the torus and through you. Okay. So now here's that spiral we're talking about. Just look at that for a second. You want to be seeing your kundalini, imagining it moving like this in a spiral through you. Now, you want to do it faster than this, of course, but this is just to show you to get the idea of, oh, okay, it's spiraling. Here's a two or a, a, a single line spiraling to give you the idea of what I'm talking about, because it's going to spiral around the outside of the torus as well as up through you. Here's two of them together to give you another idea of what that would look like. Okay. And here's a whole tour spiraling to give you an idea of what that would look like. So that's where you're heading with this. Okay. With this kind of spiraling energy through you, it's not just going around the Taurus and up, but spiraling as it goes through you. So now step two, a, Practice the kundalini in one direction while you inhale. Right hand rule going up. That's the direction of the spin. So you practice this. And again, you can practice this on your uh, on your in-breath. So you're good at it. Then step 2B, you practice it in the other direction. So on your exhale, you imagine it going down through you. All right. And then just like you did before, you alternate. 
Okay. One direction up, one direction down. All right. In breath up and around, out breath down and around. And then eventually you get them both going at the same time. And that's two Tauruses spinning through you. Just watching this. I've been doing this enough that where I just watch it, it's like, wow, I just start to feel the energy just really take off. It seems really complicated at first, but once you get used to it, it's automatic. It's just, you just literally, I can do it in a breath now, just, and the spin starts both directions. And that's all it is just to focus. One of my teachers, when I was at the ramp, the school of enlightenment, he was talking about when Christ would do miracles, they would talk about in the Bible, he would sigh first. And he said, oh yeah, of course he was just getting his breath in together because he's going to do a miracle, you know? <laughs> all right. So now step three, you get them both going as fast as you can. And that's it. Not just alternating, but both as fast as you can. The speed is important, uh, okay? Because you'll get it going really, really strong. So now, I just want to tell you a couple of things here. First of all, don't do this if you're pregnant, have a heart condition, or had a major surgery in the last six months. <laughs> it's a lot of energy, a lot of breath moving through you. Don't do it. Those are the warnings. Heart surgery, pregnant, major surgery. No, okay? All right, now my takeaways here. Hammerhoff and Haramine are talking about the same things. Their description of the movements within microtubules and voxels are eerily similar. And you've described it, how it all follows the platonic patterns, okay, of uh, this pi geometry. It's They're basically talking about the same thing. So therefore, I believe that if you can put your awareness and attention into this pattern, that's when you change space and time. And what you said about the study in Australia where they would make the decision after it would collapse into a form and then it would that would determine the collapse. I, I've seen similar studies. That, this one at Princeton where students were taking a spelling test and group A was given the words beforehand and told to study. Group B uh, did not study. And group C was given the words after they took the test and were told to study for the test. And then they all took the spelling tests and group A who studied beforehand did way better than the group that did not study. And then group C, the one that studied afterwards, did better than the group that studied beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's just great. So this is how you can move through time and space because it all exists. I mean, saying it's all connected in our linear idea of time doesn't really matter because we've got these time crystals which show you all the different states it can be in all at once. Okay. Okay. So this is basically happens because of the fractal scaling inherent in these energy patterns. Okay. Now I think the movie Contact described this process nicely. All right, so we're just going to look at that for a second. This is an artist drawing of that. So they got the three different uh, tubes or the three different bands because I don't know why three, but, you know, we did find triplets of triplets. So they got them and they're spinning them, right? And then they start to spin them faster. And when they spin them faster, they create more energy and that energy. Different amount of energy then is this vortex, this portal. Hence, I call it the portalini because it has kundalini and portals together. That's what a friend of mine said. Oh, you're teaching us portalini. And then once you have your portalini great built, you drop your consciousness in. In the movie Contact, they drop the pilot in and she takes off. Jodie Foster goes through time and space, talks to dimensional beings, and then falls out the bottom. And in Earth, no time, no space had passed. Okay, so that I thought was really, really interesting to me is that you get this torsion field where multiple directions are spinning at the same time. And they represent in the movie as three bands. But here I'm showing you it's two Tauruses moving in opposite directions at the same time. Drop your consciousness and boom. If you watch the movie The Fountain, here's the little thing where a guy does this. Hugh Jackman is the main character. And in the movie The Fountain, he's like in three different timelines and he's moving his consciousness between them. And he just happens to use the same kind of imagery to go where he wants to go. So the movie, the fountain, uh, 
Aronofsky made it. It's a beautiful watch. Okay. And so you get a sense of, oh, I'm going to create my personal portal. I put my consciousness in it. And then as a result, I get to move through time and space. Okay. So those are just some things to show you that this stuff is possible for creating, at least in artists. Artists think about this and we see it in our movies. And then, you know, Charlie and I have covered some of the science to our best of our understanding. And then I'm sharing with you what spirit has given me to say, okay, this is the next step, which is the practical use for what you're going to create. So what can you do with it? Uh, remote view, move your consciousness through time. If you want to go see history and stuff like that, uh, speak with beings. Like I said, if you're channeling, you're already doing this. You're just not aware of it. You can practice it and then access these other school, other skills. You can create something, all that manifestation, law of attraction stuff. Try doing that with a portal, portalini. Uh, you can do physical health if that's what you want. You can go visit, buy, locate. Uh, glean knowledge, change timelines. That's the stuff I'm most excited about moving to the timelines where the things are more in a line with what's going to make me happy. The key is to hold the experience in your imagination and allow it. You spin your portals up to speed, right? Both directions at once, get it going. I like to spend like five minutes or so when I'm seriously doing manifesting or stuff. I play music. Uh, I don't recommend you play music that's just terrible. Uh, you need music that's spiritually uplifting. So don't just do heavy metal rock stuff like that. You want the faster beats, but you know, sometimes classical. I like this band called Bond. These ladies are on guitars and they're just doing classical music just with a rock uh, beat to it. Really beautiful. Uh, and so you just get going, get going really, really fast, get your breathing as fast as you can, and then hold your consciousness. Now, you don't need to keep the Portolini awareness going. That's already taken place. It's around you. Just drop your consciousness into it, just like that ball being dropped through the center of it. Uh, we've done this in our meditation groups, and stuff is being reported. I can't tell you some of it because the, F, uh, the FDA will shut the channel down, and YouTube would shut the channel down because we're talking about things that are on their do not talk about list. So, uh, <laughs> But we've seen, we've seen evidence of that. Uh, Tracy and did this once where she just decided she wanted to lose uh, weight and 15 pounds lighter without changing her diet at all or exercise patterns at all in two weeks. So it's like, what? And, uh, you know, we decided we wanted to get some more exposure and interviews. So we just dropped that in there. So our YouTube channel would take off a little better that very day, that afternoon, somebody who has a big channel contacted us for an interview and then three other interviews got lined up including this one charlie um so we're just seeing right and left you just hold something drop your consciousness in boom it happens we're still exploring all this this is brand new information the actual practical uses of it many of the things what i'm talking about are things other people have been doing already we're just trying to explain to you how to get there to uh make the most of it to use your awareness and understanding and then give you a little breathing pattern and focus pattern to make it more more powerful so that's what i've got to share on this charlie uh anything wow. you want to wrap it up well a couple of questions how long do you think it takes or how much practice does it take to kind of get comfortable with this you know dual torus structure becoming sort of part of your so your... if you're if if you're sticking with it, like, so for instance, I've got a, on, on our channel, becoming awesome. One, we got classes. You can purchase this as a class and it includes okay. guided practice sessions. And okay. the practice session is about 30 minutes. And once you get it, you can just do that 30 minute practice, you know, where I'm encouraging you to focus this now, focus that, do it three or four times. And people tell me they pretty much have it after that. Got it. Okay. 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 Yeah fantastic so try it and let me know how uh, how it works you know for those of you watching uh so you can always contact myself or tracy at becoming awesome one hit the contact button let us know your okay. portalini experience uh also at becoming awesome one tracy and i do channeled clearing and uh spiritual coaching sessions we connect to your sacred higher self and do that you've experienced some of what we do charlie yeah. and uh 
it's on a donation basis three days a week so it's not going to break the bank for you but get in there and uh if you want a little bit of help because you haven't mastered these abilities yet gotcha okay well that's fantastic thank you so much for uh bringing this information to us and uh you know, it may be appropriate to do a, another follow-up session here in a little while, and maybe people would have some questions for you as well. But um, Yeah, if you ever want to do one of these live and people actually ask questions, especially if you're playing with it, I mean, yeah. let us know. This is To me, this is new information. It took me a while to understand it. I was surprised sure. as hell when I went and researched it that it's actually science and not just woo-woo, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still uh we're still learning what's next and how to use it so well that's it yeah uh, it, it always seems that these old ideas that we've still got kind of kicking around in the dustbin of history when you take them out and you polish them off you find out that they're actually spot on so uh uh like like the scaling of the platonic solids i mean it's just fascinating information so uh, anyway, I, again, I thank you so much for uh, for the information, Peter, and uh, we look forward to uh, maybe having you back on again soon. So any right. closing words? No, just blessings to everybody. Uh, yeah, and you know how to get in touch with us. Uh, you know, if you're yeah. interested in just channeled messages, not just the science, but just the uh, messages from entities all over. Uh, both Tracy and I offer them on our YouTube channel, Becoming Awesome. Uh, Tracy's been really interesting recently. She's been bringing some entities that were new to me, 12 dimensional beings and stuff. And uh, so it's quite interesting to hear what they have to say when you want to start talking about these things. So check that out on YouTube. Get at our website, becomingawesome.one. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. All right. Well, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for uh, for your time. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye.